This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. Hey, mates. Uh, before we start the episode, I just wanted to let you know about our upcoming live shows. We're doing four live shows. Dave, can you give them the dates in a second? Because I forgot what they are. But I'm also doing, I want to let them know that I'm doing a show at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. It's called Nostalgia Was Better When I Was a Boy. And it's on at the Acacia Room at the Victoria Hotel. And it's on all nights of the festival apart from Mondays. I think it's on at something like, <laughs> it's around 8 o'clock. I forget exactly. <laughs> Figure out exactly the time. Seven fifty. Yeah, I reckon seven fifty, and then six fifty on Sundays. And if you uh, click the link in the show notes, um, it'll give you all the details. You can book tickets right now, and you can do it with the discount code. Do go on for you beautiful podcast listeners. Uh, please get in and buy tickets. Make me feel better about myself. Every time, every ticket that's sold uh, builds up my self confidence a little more. <laughs> Dave, when are the dates for the live podcasts? <laughs> uh, we still have a few tickets available since we've made the room a little bit bigger on March 28th, April 4, April 11, April 18. They are four Sunday nights at 8.30 p.m. Also, click the link in the description of this episode and buy a few tickets. That would be so good. Uh, can you still get the season passes at a discount? Yes, there are still season passes available. Four shows for the price of three. The other way around. No, yeah, that's oh, right. I so I always get it wrong, but it is well. four shows. Three the shows, the price of four. <laughs> Great deal. Um, <laughs> while I've got you all, uh, I've also just started a five-part series where I interview my heroes. The first one was with Andrew Gazy Gaze, and that's already up on the Stupid Old channel, which is the Stupid Old Studios YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Stupid old channel, I guess. And the link to that is in the show notes as well. The next week's episode is with my all-time favorite AFL footballer, Saints legend, Justin Frankie Peckett. So um, get ready to watch, laugh, learn, and probably cringe a bit as I'm <laughs> doing right now, thinking back to it. <laughs> he, was really, he was really nice. I just had regrets, you know, like you do after meeting people. Ugh, why wasn't I cooler? Anyway, we should get on with the show, I guess. Hello and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnke and as always I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and before we hear more from them, let me tell you that this show is a little podcast that we've been recording for a few years now where we take it in turns to report on a topic often suggested by a listener, and uh, the person doing the report, they go away, do their research, the other people don't know what they're going to talk about, and it's Jess's turn to do that report this week. And we always start with a question to get us onto topic. JP, hit us with a question. Which World War I spy was known as the Black Panther? Oh, God, that's such a cool name. Oh. Okay. Um... It probably, to be fair, won't be a name you recognise. Okay. I'd be surprised if you've heard it. But then again, I'm an idiot, so why am I assuming that my knowledge is the same as everybody else's? So can I can I rephrase the question? You tell me what's the answer to the question? Who's this about? This is about Frederick or Fritz Duquesne. Okay, let me rephrase the question for you. Yes. All right, thanks. Uh, yep, I'm doing the report this week. I am Jess. Uh, Frederick Duquesne were fought in the First World War. He was better known uh, by which Marvel character title? Oh, my God. I actually know this. Captain America. (laughs) No, not right. Sorry. Uh, I'll have a stab on Matt. Um, Black Panther? Correct. Fuck. One for Matt. Well done, Matt. You're so smart, Matt. (laughs) Thank you, Jess. God, I wish Dave was as smart as you. He is dumb. I wish that too. Trying to keep up, isn't he? You can see the the pedals sort of moving yeah. in his brain. It's kind of sweet, but it's also <laughs> infuriating. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he's always wrong. So I like how you opened the show today, Dave. It felt like we're on like a BBC show. <laughs> Somehow, it just felt classier, right? Dave, yeah. and we both just say hello. That's, and the, that's how oh. they start all their shows, isn't it? It's like <laughs> I'm here with up. I don't want to hear from you yet. Let me explain what we're here for. Shut up. 
Shut up. We're here. Well, and just I'm, shut up. I'm here with Matt and Jess. We'll hear from them in about 15 minutes. But before that, here's some preamble. It's just very polite. I like it. I like it a lot. I feel classy. Well, um, Am I right to feel classy, Jess? No. Uh, so I put this one up to the vote because we've sort of had a couple of episodes. Uh, have we had two in a row so far that was World War I related? Yes. We kicked it off with the event that kicked off the uh, First World War, the assassination of Archduke <laughs> Franz Ferdinand's. And then yes. we heard of that famous fighter pilot, the Ace of Aces, the Red great Baron. Name. What a great name. Uh, That's right. Well, you know. Great to disagree. What do you think? What do you think of the Black Panther as a nickname? Yeah, that's sick. That's a great nickname. It's not the same word yeah. twice. If it was the Panther of Panthers, I'd be like, that's no good. Yeah, great yeah. point. Ace of Aces, stupid. <laughs> what about the Panther <laughs> of Aces? The Ace of Panthers. <laughs> the Ace of Panthers. Now yeah. we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere. Now I'm interested. That's actually cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put another um, few sort of World War One. Uh, topics up to the Patreon um, and they voted and this one won by, I think it was, at one stage it was there was 10 votes in it. I think it ended up winning by a little bit more but it was a pretty tight race. Um, but I think they chose pretty well because this is a, a fairly wild story. And firstly, I do want to mention as well that this topic was suggested by Aaron Butler and Kelly Clark. And if you want to suggest a topic, um, you can do so. There should be, a, there's a link in our uh, show description um, well, you can just chuck in any topic you think might be interesting. Um, and that's how we find most of our topics. That's right. You can also go to our website, dogoonpod.com. That's right. Or just email us and I'll email you the link. That happens a lot, um, even though we've had that link readily available for many years. I appreciate but that I you reply to it. me once a week with that uh, information. <laughs> I say, Dave, please stop hassling me on our joint email address. <laughs> You have my phone number, leave me alone. Well, you, anyway. you blocked that years ago, but anyway. <laughs> so I wanted to start with a, a quote from one of the uh, websites that I used a bit for this uh, for this report. And it says, The story of Frederick or Fritz Duquesne's life reads stranger than any fiction, and in many cases it is a fiction of his own creation. Most historical sources agree that he was a confidence trickster extraordinaire and that many details of his life were crafty embellishments or outright lies. So there's definitely going to be points where we're like, this is what is mostly believed but not super backed up. Right. Does he claim claim to have assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand himself? Yes. Also, he no. was the Red Baron. <laughs> yeah. I am the Red Baron and I'm also uh, Mary Poppins. So, <laughs> And I also shot the Red Baron. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I'm very interesting. I love it. I love a guy who writes his own fan fiction. And I'll tell you what, this guy <laughs> packs a lot into his life. So let's get stuck in. So Fritz Duquesne, I'm just going to call him Fritz through all of this. Also, his surname is spelled D-U-Q-U-E-S-N-E, but that is pronounced like Duquesne. Is that his first lie? Uh, <laughs> that does not sound right. <laughs> it doesn't. He was born in 1877 to a Boer family in South Africa. He was the eldest of three. He had a younger sister named Elspeth and a younger brother named Pedro. His father, Abraham, supported the family as a hunter and he frequently travelled to sell skins, tusks and horns. Young Fritz followed in his father's footsteps and became a hunter as well. And it was during one of his early hunting trips that he developed an interest in panthers. He observed a black panther patiently waiting, motionless, for the perfect time to strike a cautious African buffalo drinking from a nearby watering hole. He decided the panther would be his totem and he adopted the panther's hunting style into his own. <laughs> so stay still. Oh, okay. No, not not walk around on all fours. Just going <laughs> waving your arms around. Not necessarily an effective hunting style. Um, so he was actually the first to stay still when hunting. Really, wow. he came up with that. Well, he I mean, came up with that. He brought that well, into a panther. Humans. A panther came up with it. Yeah, exactly. And then he said, "Hey, panthers seem to have a bit more of a success rate than we do." I think there's. Why don't we stay still? Probably listeners who want me to. Um, question the fact that he has a he's from a family of boars we talk, <laughs> yes. we're talking wild pigs uh no uh b-o-e-r 
like the Boer War or something. The yeah, Boer, right. It, uh, they're like a Dutch and French descendants in right. South Africa. Quite dull, I'm thinking. No, that's B O R E, Dave. <laughs> we were both wrong. Damn it. This is a th- there's a third Boer. And you know what? Like sometimes I will put in um, like a bit of an explanation of things just to like clarify anything for listeners or if it would be something that maybe I would be confused by. And in that one I was like, I reckon Matt and Dave will know. Um, and so I didn't put anything in there and then I just had to r- recall it and I'm, I might be wrong. Now, what I'm, so that's fine. what I'm guessing here is that Jess knew that there's a couple of idiots here who will be asking so she wouldn't need to put that in. Oh, look, I was, I, like I said, I was asking for the listeners. I'm their conduit. Yes. I knew that the Boers were a, a Dutch, uh, South African, French. Yeah. I knew that. And that's why the Boer Wars. And I didn't always picture the Boer Wars to be pig fighting. Boers, exactly, yeah. That's not what I ever did. So <laughs> no. it's weird that you insinuated that it was. Do you know what, actually? I saw something on Facebook the other day um, that was like, I was today years old when I... Uh, realised that this little piggy went to market didn't mean it went shopping. And I was like, oh, okay, me fuck. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and why did, the one, why did one of them have false teeth? No, nobody had false teeth. This little piggy went to market, this little piggy said, this little piggy had false teeth, this little uh, piggy had oh, none, isn't yeah. it? You're thinking of roast, roast beef. Roast beef. A roast beef. This little piggy was that had the mar- false was the teeth. Mar- was that the Moraban version? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, is, I mean, wait, surely one of the there pigs are different versions. Roast beef. Yeah, I know. Oh, I mean, very different. So one of them is sent to market to be sold, slaughtered. One and of them sold. stays home. One of them stays home. Who knows one what them, it's getting up to? Watching the telly. One of them eats some cow. Okay, roast. One of them day. has nothing. One has none. Jeez. And one of them goes wee 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 all the way home. Okay, but one of them is already at home. It's so confusing. It's really odd. I suppose, like any home, they kind of come and go as they please. Yeah, but five very different outcomes for those five pigs. Which would you prefer? I'd prefer to have the false teeth. (laughs) (laughs) I'd prefer to stay home. Yeah, I think that's probably the one. Yeah, that's the good one, I reckon. Um, But going wee, 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 wee does sound fun too. Yeah, that's Mm. me. Mm. Yeah, that's you, Dave. You can have that one. Thanks. Anyway, now, uh, so yes, he's decided uh, (laughs) that the panther will be his totem and he will stay still when hunting. Now, I'm not entirely sure how old he was when he started hunting or when he decided he would use the Black Panther as a totem, but I did read something kind of fucked that was very flippantly mentioned on Wikipedia. It just said, at age 12, Fritz killed his first man. I was like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Moving Um, on. (laughs) A Zulu man who attacked his mother. He used the man's own short sword to stab him in the stomach. Right, at 12. That was it. That's it. Two sentences about a 12-year-old committing murder. Um, Killed at twelve, but it sounds like was it, it self defense is what what it's how it's told, right? I suppose so. Yeah. If but he was it, attacking it, his mother, that sounds like well, not self defense, mother defense. Yeah, but it can you use seems, that more in the court of law? It seems this would be the first of many killings the young Fritz would make. Oh, is that because, always in defense of his mother? Yeah, people are attacking his mother well, constantly. Well, it's a family. Apparently, a gun battle broke out at one point, and Fritz, still a child, shot and killed several people. Okay. Baffling. Um, It's speculated that his family were rather well off and this is supported by the fact that at 13 he was sent to school in England and after graduating he attended Oxford University for a year before attending the Royal Military Academy in Brussels. Although it's worth mentioning that a record of his attendance at either of these institutions uh, does not exist. So that's fun. Okay. Um, and Are they good at since... keeping records at Oxford University? Yeah, the sure. They, they, they couldn't keep track of every student. Or the Royal Military student. Academy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a military academy is not going to be taking fastidious sort of records. We've got a lot on, okay. Hmm. Are you in the army? You? No. You're not. Okay, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Just people as they walk past the base. <laughs> hey, come back to work if you work here. <laughs> You don't? Okay. Well, again, keep, keep, all right. keep sorry, going. How am I meant to tell these people apart? I mean, some of them are you wearing there, army You holding fatigues. a picnic basket <laughs> and uh, and a kite. Do you work here? A picnic basket full of grenades, is it? Bring them back. Bring them back. Oh, you just sandwiches? Okay, as you were. Is also that bring them kite a murder drone or not? <laughs> Which one is it? Oh, we don't have those yet. A fun drone okay. or a murder drone? <laughs> So um, another sort of quote here is that since much of what has been written about the man has its origin in a 1932 biography in which he collaborated, 
there may indeed be some grounds for doubt. So he kind of he could be bullshitting uh, and this biography is kind of like one of the main sources. So that's possible. But we believe he went to Oxford and then the Royal Military Academy. Um, even Fritz himself wrote that after he finished school in England, he was sent to Europe to study engineering. But on on the ship, he met an embezzler named Christian de Vries and the two decided to take a trip around the world. So even his own writing sort of contradicts it a little bit. But regardless of what he was studying, when the Second Boer War broke out in 1899, 22-year-old Fritz returned to South Africa to join the Boer commandos as a lieutenant. And during the Siege of Ladysmith, which is a fantastic name of a battle, uh, Fritz was wounded, shot in his right shoulder. After this siege, he was promoted to the rank of captain in the artillery. During the Second Boer War, when British forces began to put more pressure on, some of the gold from the central bank was taken to be shipped to the Netherlands for the use of President Paul Kruger and other Boer exiles who had fled South Africa. Basically, the president was kind of like, oh, we might actually lose this. So he took a bunch of money out of the bank in gold and, like, shipped it. I, you know, some of it would have been used towards war efforts. Some of it would have been to help people who had fled. But the Some gold... of it would have been used for false teeth. Some of it would have been used for none. <laughs> some of it would have been used for wee, 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 wee. The gold was sent by train to the small uh, to a small town, and then by road to uh, Lorenzo Marquis in uh, Portuguese East Africa, now Mozambique, and then shipped to the Netherlands. So it was like this big, epic kind of journey for the gold to go on. Collectively, it was about one point five million pounds, or six hundred and eighty thousand kilos, of gold bullions was what? taken from the South African mint between the twenty ninth of May and the fourth of June, nineteen hundred. So, in the space of a few days, one point five million pounds of gold taken out of the bank. Crazy. That is. So what was that number? One point five million pounds. And this is in the olden days. So that's worth more even now, right? That's like in uh, that's weight. Yeah. So six hundred and eighty thousand oh. kilos. <laughs> I don't even understand what that means. Yeah. That's a lot of gold. Is that it's worth? A lot. That's worth like many pounds. That sounds like most of the gold ever. Wow. Yeah, I don't think there's any gold left. Jeez. And guess who was in command of one of these large shipments? Ooh. Um, Johnny Boar. Darren. Yes, Oaks. actually. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God, you guys are very good at this. But also another one was Fritz Duquesne. Um, yeah, he had some as well. So while in the Portuguese East African wilderness, a violent disagreement broke out amongst the Boers. I'm not sure how many men there were on the journey, but by the end of the violent disagreement, only Fritz, two wounded Boer soldiers and their totties, who were like native porters, remained alive. So just a bunch of people died over a disagreement. We don't have any information on what the disagreement was over, but it got violent. Wow. So Fritz ordered the totties to hide the gold in the caves for safekeeping and to burn the wagon and kill the wounded. <laughs> He's brutal. I do love the word totties, though. Totties for such great, a brutal little it? story. There you go. What a, what a nice word in the middle. Little totty. Little native porters. I guess they're kind of like the equivalent of Sherpas or something. Um, so he gave the totties all the oxen except for one, which he rode away on, and a historian named Art Ronnie, incredible name, writes in 1995 that the buried central bank gold, commonly referred to as Kruger's Millions, is only a legend. However, in more recent times, there have been reports about discoveries in South Africa of the missing gold buried by Duquesne. I read that um, there was a story going around as recently as 2001 that a family had found the gold, but there's still no proof. The story goes that this big fight broke out, the gold was hidden, and he rode off on an ox. Ah, wow. Something that is a little bit frustrating about Fritz's story is that you read wild bits of info, like this violent disagreement happening, and then the next piece of info, he's somewhere completely different doing something else, and the connecting tissue of the story isn't around or it isn't readily available in the resources that I, I've found. So it feels to me like there's just a series of jump cuts or it's like a sitcom where you kind of, like you can pop in at any time and, and you, you kind of His life is it. a series of vignettes. Yes, <laughs> thank you. 
all played by Steve Buscemi. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he, he just sounds like maybe he might be magic or something. Do you think? Okay. So maybe people are like he's made it up but really he's a wizard. Okay. And that's why he's just all of a sudden I'm here, new reality, and he's just snapping his yeah, fingers. Yeah, right. Okay. Maybe he's more like a, a he can travel through space and time yes. maybe. He's using all of his brain, 100%, not like us, yeah. according to some movies. He's using all of it. Uh, like, well, it sounds like an awesome way to steal a shitload of gold as well as saying, oh, I oh, know, I had the totties hide it in this cave here and then you yeah. just take it all and then for the next 100 years people get looking for people it. People keep looking for it. Anyway, so the next we hear of Fritz, he's back with the Boer forces for the Battle of Bergendal in 1900 where his unit were captured by the Portuguese and sent to an internment camp. While in the internment camp in Portugal, he charmed the daughter of one of the guards who then helped him escape to Paris. Again, like not a lot of info, he just charmed her. Charmed the daughter of one of the guards. Yeah, why was she hanging around at this internment camp? And it's, what she's like, Dad, let this prisoner go. Dad, he charmed me. Uh, <laughs> Dad, I like him. Come on, please. Nice. We're going to run away together. Dad, Me and that prisoner. Dad. He's a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like work experience or something. and um, Yeah. She got well, that really is an involved. internment camp, Dave, so that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Internship camp. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, you know something's good is when someone grimaces. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just took me a bit to get it. I was like, I don't get it. Intern. Um, so he escapes to Paris. From Paris he made his way to England where he infiltrated the British Army. So as an officer in the British Army, he was posted to South Africa where he was from. Oh, yes. okay. Kind of like he scored a free ride home. Yeah, uh, to get home. But while there with the British Army, his unit passed through his parents' farm in Nostrum and it had been completely destroyed. Oh, that would be shattering. And you've got to pretend it's not, you know, because you that would give away who you are. So you just have to oh. pretend to be unaffected. So would, his, he, would he be fighting on the... Opposite side to his parents or? Yeah. Right. So they have to He's be like, yeah, the British. glad this. So the the Boer army fought against the English army. Yeah. Which I knew as well. Just clarifying. These are all things For I everybody else. Knows. And I'm saying it with a lot of confidence too when I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of families have lost their properties under Herbert Kitchener's scorched earth policy. It's basically a military strategy that aims to destroy anything that might be helpful to the enemy. So farms, gone. Fritz also learnt that his sister had been killed and his mother was dying in a British concentration camp. And this is a quote from historian Art Ronnie again. Uh, it's such a good quote. It says, The fate of his country and his family would breed in him an all-consuming hatred of England and would turn him into what uh, a biographer, Clement Wood, called a walking, living, breathing, searing, killing, destroying torch of hate. Whoa. He's just like, I fucking hate the British. Sounds yeah. like you have the dictionary open. Yeah. <laughs> um, killing, destroy. He's just like got a mind map and some textures. Mm, horny, maybe. Horny. Um, frazzled. <laughs> horny so and he's, frazzled. <laughs> My ears are burning. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to be. <laughs> so he's uh, very understandably pissed. It really sounds like so far what you've told is the the, ver the opening um, of a film. This is the origin story of how, you know, Rambo or I don't know, I've never seen Rambo, but one of those films where someone's out to get vengeance. Yeah, John Wick absolutely. or something. Absolutely. Have you seen John Wick? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that it, his dog or cat is killed and then he in the rest of the movie is him getting vengeance for the dead dog or cat. All right, spoiler. I think that's right at the start. So it still spoils it for me. I still haven't seen the very start of it. <laughs> Sorry, Jess. Edit that out so I don't ruin it for others. <laughs> so he returned to Cape Town with secret plans to sabotage British war efforts and to kill Kitchener. John Wick, I mean. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to fucking kill him. But he was going to need some help, a ragtag bunch, oh, if you will. This is a movie. Love it. Yeah. He recruited 20 Boar men to help him. Not sure if these were people that he already knew um, or how he recruited them. Um, however, it's always risky involving that many people in any plan because apparently the wife of one of the men betrayed the group, oh. giving them away to the British. 
and on October 11th, 1901, while attending a fancy dinner party, Fritz was arrested for conspiracy against the British government and on the charge of espionage. Now, I feel confident as the feminist of this podcast to say this, but that was the wife who got them in the yeah. groove there. We, yep. Yeah. Well, I feel fine saying this. Like I say, credentials are out there on the table. A feminist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Never trust women. Mm. Oh, God, I'm glad you said it. Because <laughs> I know that was I thought, on everyone's I thought, minds. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But I was like, well, I can't bloody say it, can I? No, it would seem get, like. I'll get maybe... cancelled. I'll get cancelled. Yes. I already have been, so I'm fine. Yeah, you can't As get double cancelled. As a card-carrying feminist, you're allowed to say <laughs> it. I'm allowed to say it. Yeah, I'm part of the, <laughs> yeah. the good guys. Uh, but, yeah, Dave Dave knows he, he can't get double cancelled. It's a double jeopardy. You can't mm, kill what's right. already dead. I could walk up to feminism in the in Times Square and pull the trigger if I remember that quote from the movie Double Jeopardy. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a fun reference for everyone. Starring. I'm sure there's one um, person. There must have been one person who got that. I saw that film in gold class. Oh, and what did you eat? Did you eat a curry? Is she going to curry uh, again? No, this was in the early days. I got a free ticket to this. I didn't have any money to then buy food. No one's ever paid for for gold class, have they? Who's done that? Isn't it only ever vouchers? Only ever a Somebody, prize or a, a gift. A relative has given a relative who doesn't know you that well has got you in the family KK and just gone. Well, that'd be nice. How do they? Oh yeah. Okay. And so you that's always how they use make it. Money. Use it in the last week of the two years you're allowed to. You of have course, it for. yeah. Because so you go, fuck. We really should use this. And the only thing. Oh no, no. It's only double jeopardy. All right. Guess I'm watching double jeopardy. Guess. guess Tommy we'll Lee see. Jones. Tommy Lee Jones and. Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd from that Phrasing the Bar movie we watched the other the other month. Let's not talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Double Jeopardy is good. It's a good uh, movie. I think it's fine. Well, I mean, I remember enjoying it ten ish years ago when I saw it. So, but it's better than whatever that trash was. Uh, the the coming of age of Nushly Mood or something like that. No, The Passion. The Passion of Darkly Noon. Darkly Noon. Got it. Thank you. I was pretty close. Anyway, what are weird sidetracks? Yes. Okay. So, yes, he's charged. He's arrested for conspiracy against the British government and on the charge of espionage. He was court-martialed uh, as a, I mean, we say lieutenant, don't we? Yeah, I think so. But it's spelt the same as lieutenant. lieutenant. And it looks like it should be lieutenant, really. I'm going to say Lieutenant. He was court-martialed as a lieutenant in the British Army and sentenced to be shot along with his co-conspirators. Right. So the next day, the 20 members of his team were executed by firing squad. Oh, God. Fritz, however, managed to get a plea bargain at the last second and in exchange for secret bore codes and some translations, Fritz's life would be spared. Oh, he dug the boys. He would instead boys. receive a life in prison. Yeah, he did. Oh, my God. He's a grass. So they all died. Dave, you think he dogged the boys, but this, that's not at all right. What he did was he he got in the mind of the Black Panther. He said, what would the Black <laughs> Panther do? Plea bargain. And, you yeah, know, exactly. Lay still and get a plea bargain. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. I think so, it, it, it's, I think this is if if this is even correct that we say maybe the British say lieutenant and Americans say lieutenant, which I think is right, but it might not be. Yeah. But it just seems like one of the many examples of Americans going, "You're saying your own words wrong. We're going to fix it for you." Yeah. Don't you that, I think they did yeah, that with absolutely. a lot of different words where they're like, "That's not right." We're changing Z to Z. Makes more sense. Rhymes with A B C. Let's just make it easy for everyone. We're like, it's Z for zebra. <laughs> Shut up, you wanker. Well, I say it's Z for zebra. <laughs> you know? Touche. Well, oh, it's beautiful. We're all so beautiful. different. I love it. I love coming together over our... Yeah, it's nice because like, we have so many things that are different about us but then like so many things that are similar. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I know what like, you mean. Like we all have blood inside yeah. us. Not me. <laughs> Not since I got cancelled. You got ooze. <laughs> they take they your remi- blood. They remove your blood? Yeah, huh. they replace it with ooze. What colour is the ooze? Green. Yeah, the preferred colour of ooze. Classic ooze colour. Classic ooze. Anyway, so he's got a life sentence now. And this historian Art Ronnie wrote, for the rest of his life he swore he never betrayed the Boer cause but actually created new codes that would mislead the British. But, again, who knows? That's what he swears. Was he just like jumping on the spot and like grabbing one ear and pulling it down saying, this means hello? (laughs) Yeah, just do that and then they'll know. 
So he was imprisoned in Cape Town in the Castle of Good Hope. Well, that sounds that good. Nice? That's a great place to be imprisoned. It was a fort built by the Dutch in, in the 1600s, in 1666 actually, fun to say. The walls of the castle were extremely thick, yet night after night Fritz dug away the cement around the stones with an iron spoon. He was like, I'm getting out of here. He nearly escaped one night, but a large stone slipped and pinned him in his little tunnel. The next morning, a guard found him unconscious but uninjured. So he nearly got out, but he, he didn't quite make it. But he also he just gave fell asleep. the game away. Oh, yeah, he was he... doing what a panther would do, Dave. <laughs> yeah, just lie, lie there. still. Be patient. If Wait I can't see you, uninjured. you can't see me. He was eventually sent to a penal colony um, in Bermuda, known for its frequent storm conditions, shark-infested waters and dangerous reefs. The British believed it to be an inescapable prison, but has that ever stopped anyone from trying? (laughs) I think every time an inescapable prison comes up on this show, someone's about to escape. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely, or an unsinkable ship. Sure, that was just one time, but it bears repeating. I think if if Uh, anyone is wondering about... um, any shapes that come off Bermuda, uh, triangles in particular, they should go back and listen to our Bermuda Triangle episode where we go into great detail explaining what that's all about, I think. <laughs> it's a very vague memory. I remember none nah, of that. No, me neither. It was a long Matt, time ago. I remember ago. leaving this. I remember Matt had his head in a bucket during the episode, <laughs> so. Yeah, but he was also wearing a suit, so he looked great while feeling shit. So, you and know, evens out. you take the wins where yeah. you can. Yeah, exactly. Um, So on the night of June 25th, 1902, he slipped out of his tent, climbed over the barbed wire fence and swam 1.5 miles or 2.4 kilometres past patrol boats and managed to make it to land. Wow. Tents are very easy to break out of, admittedly. What, did he have a pair of scissors? (laughs) He dug out with a spoon. Surely this is pre-Velcro, so he probably just walked out of it. It was just a flap. Maybe, Maybe his zippers were invented. Maybe. Maybe. They <laughs> put him in an inescapable tent. <laughs> zippers feel when, like modern tech, don't they? Probably yeah, the last couple of zips decades. Yeah, zips a thing? How'd you do up a jacket? All buttons. Ugh. Oh, my God. So tedious. Imagine buttoning up a tent every time. Pain in the ass. Oh, my God. I wouldn't camp. I'll tell you that for free. I wouldn't bloody go camping if I had to button up a tent. I don't go camping as it is, but. Double wouldn't. Definitely double. not. Yeah, double wouldn't. So he's made it to land and from there he went to the home of Anna Maria Outerbridge, a leader of a Ball Relief Committee, and she helped him escape to the port of St George's where another Ball Relief Committee member, Captain W.E. Meyer, arranged for his transportation off the island. So they helped him basically escape. Right. A week later, Fritz stowed away on on a boat heading to Baltimore and, uh, uh, by the way, he's only 25 at this point. Wow. Wow. Wow, the Red Baron's already dead at this stage. <laughs> yeah. From Baltimore, he headed to New York City. Now, with his hunting and military background, what kind of jobs might he be qualified for? Oof. Lobby boy. Lobby boy. Wobby's world attendant. Wobby's world attendant, mm. yes. Ice cream truck um, driver. Ice cream truck driver, of course. These are all good examples. But he, of course, got a job as a journalist. Uh. Oh, um, writing adventure stories for the New York Herald. The Second the second Boer War ended not long after, but with his family gone and his list of war crimes, he never returned to South Africa. <laughs> Funny that, a list of war yeah. crimes. I mean, that's the only thing stopping me from going home is a list of war yeah. crimes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how at the start um, we said that we don't really know how much to trust because he bullshitted a lot? Well, there was a write-up about him in a magazine in 1908 saying he was a travelling correspondent that had been all over the world but there was no evidence found to back that up. So it, it might have been true, some of it might have been true, some might have been lies. He's a bit of a Maybe tough Maybe he just one. had a, 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 a wrote under an assumed name or something. Yeah, that's quite possible too, yeah. But didn't you just say his job is to write adventure stories? So like his job yeah. is to make fun shit up. Yep. Exactly but he also right. wouldn't really want to get, if he is uh, wanted for war crimes, he probably doesn't want to put his name down on, you know, well-circulated prose. He seems to not give too much of a shit about that. <laughs> okay. To be completely honest. In 1910, I mean, this isn't like super relevant, but it's just, I guess, worth mentioning. He married an American woman called Alice Wortley, 
though the marriage would end in divorce eight years later. Eight years, pretty good run. Um, not bad, not bad. Another one of the reasons Wartley, people suggest this topic is because... Like a warthog, like a boar. Okay. Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> Another one of the reasons people suggest this topic is because of a weird thing that happened around this time. The US was going through a serious meat shortage. So in 1910, the New Food Supply Society was founded by Congressman Robert uh, Broussard to import African wildlife into the US as a solution. The congressman introduced the American Hippo Bill to import hippos into Louisiana as a new food source. (laughs) <laughs> this sounds this plan was bonkers. Ba- it's it's bonkers, but it was backed up by like so many people were on board with it. Teddy Roosevelt, the US Department of Agriculture and the media, the New York Times praised the taste of hippo as lake cow bacon. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Lake cow, lake cow bacon. bacon. <laughs> That's funny. Dave, would you be into eating some lake cow bacon? Yeah, it sounds like someone had the dictionary open. <laughs> Okay, what's something else for like a swamp? Lake? Uh, lake. Okay. Dude, that sounds like an imp- improv troupe. They've asked us suggestions. Yeah. What do we got? <laughs> lake? Yep. Cow? Okay. Bacon? Uh-huh. Let's see what we can do here. I mean, it sounds like us trying to do the Patreon reads at the end of an episode. <laughs> we'll do one word each. We'll do one word each. So they brought Fritz on as an expert given his expertise in lake cow a- and bacon. hunting experience. Exactly. The bill ended up falling through, but Fritz became Teddy Roosevelt's personal shooting instructor and accompanied him on hunting expeditions. This guy's had such a weird life. That is so odd. It's all true. It's wild. Yeah, and this is a quote from Wiki. It says, he published several newspaper articles on Roosevelt's hunting trip to Africa, safari big game hunting in general, and the heroic accomplishments of white peoples in Africa. Okay. (laughs) Yep. Um, by December 1913, Fritz was a naturalised American citizen, which was great news because the First World War started six months later. Naturally, as a proud American now, he became a German spy. <laughs> what? He hated the British. Right. So obviously his main motivation was fucking them over. He was sent to Brazil as, get this name, this is, a, this is an alias, Frederick Fredericks. Oh, that's good. <laughs> That raise any suspicions? So bad that no one would question it because who would, yeah. in their right mind, would come up with that? Exactly. It does feel like the kind of name you've come up with on the spot. You were yeah, put under pressure. Yeah, and you've pressure. seen two guys called Frederick. Yeah. Even like they say that if it's uh, a sure sign of a fake name if there's alliteration, just the same letter twice, you go the full same name twice. That's Yeah. That's, that's uh, alarm bells. Absolutely. Um, and he was, uh, so Frederick Fredericks was there under the disguise of doing scientific research on rubber plants. Wait, like fake fake plants? Or it could be the plant, rubber plant, hard to say. The plant, rubber well, I mean, plant? Oh, it could be the plant, rubber plant, plant. Called the rubber plant. Yeah, that's, where you, that's where you get rubber. What? <laughs> rubber plant. All of this, I mean, I don't know if you guys are fuck with me or what, but. <laughs> No, this. I mean, rubber plants are a real type. Of I know plant. Robert plant. Just, oh my god! <laughs> is that so over the next few years, no, over the next few years, he is credited with sinking twenty-two ships by planting time bombs disguised as cases of mineral samples on British ships. Planting them. people are like, what are you Jesus doing? Guys, what are you doing here? Plants all of a sudden. Yeah. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm just uh, inspecting the plants. They're like, oh, okay, all right, carry on, sir. Great. I mean, why would someone lie about that? It's just so dumb. Yeah. Frederick, so especially someone with a, a respectable name like Frederick Fredericks. He's disguising them as cases of mineral samples. And, uh, yeah, after bombing the Tennyson MI5 operating in Brazil, arrested an accomplice named Bauer who identified Fritz as the perpetrator and the ringleader and gave them other aliases that Fritz was operating under, including George Fordham and Piet Neokud, which is Duquesne backwards. Oh, that's clever. <laughs> I'd be Snickrup. Oh. Pretty cool. Oh, I'd be Eckenraw. Oh. How are you guys doing it so quick? <laughs> Have you not known Trawets. that? Trawets. Just had that locked and loaded. Trawets is pretty good. That almost Trawets sounds like it's bad. real. I mean, a bit better than Snickrup, yeah. yeah it's, that's kind of, it sounds delicious. Yeah, it does. It sounds like a little treat. Mm. 
So with his cover blown, he fled to Argentina and several weeks later placed an article in a newspaper reporting his own death in Bolivia at the hands of Amazonian natives. Oh, okay. He reported his own death. Who who to? This is the world. He wrote a story <laughs> about it. <laughs> Signed off, me, the guy who died. Yeah. Oh, no. It was all true. Oh, dear. It was all a dream. I mean, oh, no. Somehow he managed to evade MI5 and return to New York in early to mid-1916. And using the aliases George Fordham and Frederick Fredericks, he'd taken out insurance policies for the cargo he shipped and he now filed claims for the films and mineral samples lost with the ships that he sank off the coast of Brazil, including the British steamship Tennyson. So he's taken out insurance policies on the stuff that he's pretending to ship and then blowing up the boat and then claiming the insurance. That's a sweet scheme. Well, things seemed pretty fishy and the insurance companies were reluctant to pay and began their own investigations, which would go on for about a year. They would look into it. Classic insurance companies always dragging their feet when you're trying to rip them off through fraud. (laughs) Take their bloody time. Is MI5 Bond? Yeah. No, it's MI6. He's isn't MI6, Dave? yeah. Uh, MI6. This is MI5. Even more Blame. secretive. Wow. While they were investigating, Fritz had word from German intelligence that he was needed in Europe. So off he goes. And in Scotland, he posed as Russian Duke Boris Z- Zakrevsky. And he boarded HMS Hampshire with Field Marshal Kitchener the man who had ordered the destruction of his family's farm and who he had vowed to kill. No. Oh and what's he so, And they've just boarded what together? The HMS Hampshire. Whoa. Wow. This, has this not been made into a film? This feels like a film. It's like uh, if I was watching this film, I'm like a bit far-fetched. I'm not believing this. Dial, dial it back a bit. I can't remember which movie it is that they said was like pretty loosely... Based on his life, oh, what was it? But it it has right. it, it's, it, it has it been made like it has into to have been. the house on Ninety Second Street. Right. Um. I mean, that's a an old film anyway, but it's said to be loosely based on him. But I don't think there's super recent ones. I think I might I might uh, buy the rights. I might option this. I reckon. Okay, great. Maybe stupid old can, can make I a, play a film about it? Can I play Fritz Duquesne? Yeah. Thank you I so love, much. I think Boris is my favorite. It's like my, the Russian Gary or Greg. It's right up there. Yeah, so Boris good is good. A, a name. Boris, Greg, Gary. They're my top three, I reckon. So they're on, he's on a ship with the man that he has vowed to kill. So his whole life has led up to this moment, basically. Yeah, yeah. So once on board, Fritz signaled a German submarine and shortly before 7 30 p.m., Hampshire struck a mine laid by the newly launched German U-boat U-75, so the submarine that he'd signalled. Hampshire sank, taking all but 12 survivors. I think over 700 people died. Kitchener was not one of the survivors. So he got him? Got him. Did he get himself? The news of Kitchener's death was received with shock all over the British Empire. People saw it as basically meaning the war was lost. Fritz, on the other hand, made his own escape using a life raft before the ship was torpedoed and he was rescued by the submarine. So he no made it. way. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. He got picked up by a sub. So yeah. many people die in wars. Isn't that wild? An insane amount of people who do not deserve to die. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's many people who do deserve to die, but, you know. Cats out of the bag, When it's like heaps of civilians, when heaps of civilians die, you're like, oh, this is fucked. it's pretty clear you think some people deserve to die, and I think it's our right to ask you to list them Uh right now. The listeners deserve to die. Where's the list? Come on. Show us the list. (laughs) All right. Put away the list, Jess. If we want to just take a moment to think about the list, (laughs) we don't have to jump straight (laughs) into the list, Jess. End of list. Thank God for that. Jess, do you need to maybe you need to revise this list? Let's have a let's not put the Matt, list out. You're getting in yourself public. put on the list two times now, mate. You now you definitely you double you can't need get to double die. killed. You can't get double killed, Jess. Can't you, Matt? You want to find out? Well, well actually, having uh, recently heard Dave's <laughs> that he wrote when he was 12 years old, which was a recent do go on bonus episode. Um, yeah, 
maybe I don't want to give too much away, but maybe you can be killed twice. <laughs> Two homicides, <laughs> one victim. victim. That was the title that, of uh, that's good shit. my self-published novel, so thank you so much. So Fritz returned once again to the US, but now his stories of great white hunters and African safaris no longer fascinated the American public. And when he returned to New York, he was dropped from the lecture circuit. So he needed new material and he reinvented himself and pretended to be an Allied war hero, Captain Claude Stoft, Stoughton, Stockton, Stoughton. Wow, that's a long name. Is that the, yeah, was that the full name for Beta? Did you look that up? Stoughton, Stockton, 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 Stockton. I hate Stockton, both of you. Stockton, Stockton. <laughs> Stockton. <laughs> Captain Claude Stoughton that's of the for Western sure. Australian Light Horse Regiment. Oh, really? He's an Aussie. Yeah, a man who claimed to have seen more war than any man at present and claimed to have been bayoneted three times, gassed four times and stuck once with a hook. Okay. That is... So he's created this character. That sounds like a great character. (laughs) Yeah. And he appeared before many audiences as Captain Claude, telling them war stories. There's a historian called John Muallam who explains uh, Captain Claude's career took off. His talks made decent money. His heroism earned him respect and the ladies found him alluring. <laughs> Tell us again how you were hit with a hook. <laughs> Can we see the scars? No. No. Oh, but eventually the insurance investigation caught up with him and he was arrested in New York on the 17th of November 1917 on charges of fraud. He had in his position some pretty damning evidence too. A large file of news clippings relating to the bombing of ships, a letter from the assistant German vice consul <laughs> saying that Fritz was one was one who had rendered considerable service to the German oh cause. Oh, he's God. keeping this on his person. Yeah, he had he that He buried with him. the gold, but he kept all the evidence of his crimes on him. But also, this isn't necessarily the crimes that the Americans want him for. They they want him for insurance fraud. But the British want him for murder on the high seas, <laughs> arson, faking documents and conspiring against the Crown. <laughs> Arresting someone for fraud and then finding out that they just last week sank a ship with 700 people on board. You'd be like, this is way above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to do here, to be honest. I investigate fraud. <laughs> I'm a pencil pusher. <laughs> this isn't my jurisdiction. So the American authorities agreed that they would extradite Fritz to Britain if the British sent him back afterwards to serve his sentence for fraud. I mean, is he coming back after that? Who knows? After you've completed your 800 years in prison, you better come back here to serve six months. (laughs) While awaiting extradition to Britain on murder charges, Fritz pretended to be paralysed. Oh, like a Black Panther. Yes. Laying in wait. He was sent to the prison ward at Bellevue Hospital on May 25th, 1919, after nearly two years of feigning paralysis. No. Yes, he just faked. So he just had to shit himself for two years. Sure. (laughs) I don't know what paralysis paralysis means. (laughs) It's not diarrhea. Are you confusing diarrhea for paralysis? No, I'm talking about you'd have to be like, oh, no, I can't move. I can't move for two years. So you just have to sit there or lie there. Pretending you can't move. I believe it was sort of like. Oh, was he like, oh, my fingers, I've got my fingers gone to sleep. I think it was like legs. He needed to, he he would say he had to walk with a cane and stuff. To be fair, I was imagining full paralysis that like you're lying there being like, oh, no, I can't move. No, I don't think he had to. No, Dave, you weren't thinking that. You were just thinking this guy had to shit himself. You went to to shit himself, Dave. The only way to convince people that you're truly paralysed is to sit, to lie there yourself. and shit yourself for two straight years and then they start taking you pretty seriously. But they're not watching you 24 hours either, right? He might, he might yeah, be like, they? oh, actually. They'd have to shit at some point. Yeah, and at that time you do So well. that, that's when you shit. It's like when you have a newborn baby. And then they baby, start to go, people say, how's this guy never needed to shit? Yeah, or in the middle of the night they just hear the toilet flush and they run down there and he's just lying there. He's like, yeah. I don't know what happened. He's like, that was weird. <laughs> Did you hear anyway. that? Did you hear that? A ghost just did a shit in my room. So two years of feigning paralysis and just days before his extradition, he disguised himself as a woman and escaped by cutting the bars of his cell and climbing over the barrier walls to freedom. Okay, so, right. so he didn't have to be paralysed at all. I don't know what he cut the bars with. And, and where did he had that the, whole the costume time. come No, in. he didn't have to pretend to be paralysed. Why was he dressing up if he was escaping through bars? It's like someone's cutting through no those idea. bars. Oh, no, hang on. It's a woman. <laughs> Off you go. No worries. 
Women are allowed to do that. It's fine. Sounds to me like he uh, shat himself every day for two years for no reason. Once again, Dave, that is something you have projected onto Fritz. Don't project shitting, um, Dave. I also write my own adventure stories. Uh, for example, two homicides, one victim. So, <laughs> so he's 42 at this point too, by the way. He's just escaped from prison. Over the next few years, he spent time in Mexico and various places in Europe before coming back to New York in 1926 and taking yet another fake name, Frank de Trafford Craven. Ooh. A poo de Beaumarchais. <laughs> it's not bad. And he just started working in publicity. <laughs> He worked for various film companies over many years and in May of 1932, police arrested 55-year-old Fritz and he was interrogated and beaten by police and charged with murder on the high seas. Fritz claimed, it's mistaken identity. My name's Craven. You got the wrong guy. Conveniently, a biography had just been written about Fritz by author Clement Wood, so police asked this author to come in and identify the man. Clement said, this isn't Fritz Duquesne. This is Major Craven, a man I've known for years. So he covers for him. Wow. Police don't believe him, though, and they bring in Agent Thomas J. Tunney, who had arrested Fritz back in 1917, and he positively ID'd him. However, Britain declined to pursue his war crimes, noting that the statute of limitations had expired, and the judge threw out the only remaining charge, which was escape from prison, and he just released right. him. So war crimes, the statute of limitations is like about six days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a while later, oh, but that's crazy. He was crazy. in front of bars for a couple of, couple of decades, uh, no, two years, was he? Yeah, so he got it. He escaped prison in uh, 1919. Now we're talking 1932. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, it's a bit of time. So it's a while later. Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, who was uh, the head of Germany's Division of Military Intelligence, knew of Fritz Duquesne from his work in World War I, and he instructed his new chief of operations in the US, Colonel Nicholas Ritter, to make contact with Fritz. He's like, this guy could be handy for us. The two had actually known each other a few years earlier and reconnected in New York in December of 1937. Ritter employed several other successful agents across the US, but he also made the mistake of recruiting a man who would later become a double agent, William Siebold. On the 8th of February, 1940, Ritter sent Siebold to New York under the alias of Harry Sawyer and instructed him to set up a shortwave radio transmitting station to establish contact with the German shortwave station abroad. Once the FBI discovered through Siebold that Fritz Duquesne was again in New York operating as a German spy, Director J. Edgar Hoover provided a background briefing to President Franklin Roosevelt. So it's just crazy that all these big, such powerful people are talking about this one guy. They're like, oh, fuck, Fritz Duquesne's around again. Um, So FBI agents... um, there was a one FBI agent, he used a fake name, Ray McManus, was now assigned to Fritz and he rented a room immediately above Fritz's apartment near Central Park and used a hidden microphone to record all of Fritz's conversations. But tracking a spy isn't very easy. Um, as the FBI agent described it, he said, the Duke, that bunch, they called him the Duke, had been a spy for all of his life and automatically used all the tricks in the book to avoid anyone following him. He'd take a local train, change to an express, change back to local, go through a revolving door and keep going on <laughs> right around. Classic trick. He'd take an elevator up a floor. He constantly knows every revolving door in the city. Yeah, yeah. he's like, I can always find one. He'd take um, an elevator up a floor, get off, walk back to the ground, take it off in a different take off a different um, entrance to the building. So he was already kind of, without knowing fully yet that he was being tracked, he was always acting as if he was. What a nightmare way to travel. (laughs) Yeah, it'd be exhausting, wouldn't it? Just like to get to the shops, it would take you 11 hours. (laughs) Yeah, I just need milk. Seven revolving doors later, I'm at the milk bar. So in June of 1941, following a two-year investigation, the FBI arrested Fritz Duquesne and 32 German spies on charges of relaying secret information on US weaponry and shipping movements to Germany. It's crazy. So that's June of 1941. January 1942, less than a month after the US was attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor, 
and Germany declared war on the United States, the 33 members of the Duquesne spy ring were sentenced to serve a total of more than 300 years in prison. Wow. It's it's huge. Historian Peter Duffy said, still to this day, it's the largest espionage case in the history of the United States. So there's a whole big thing, like you could you could look into that in a lot more detail, but yeah, he was a spy for several several years working out of the US. And 64-year-old Fritz Duquesne did not escape this time. He was sentenced to 18 years in prison. In 1954, he was released owing to ill health, having served 14 years. His last known lecture was in 1954 at the Adventurers Club of New York titled My Life In and Out of Prison. He gets out of jail and goes and does a, a, a lecture, which is baffling. Yeah, I guess he's going to make cash. Yeah, you're right. And Fritz Duquesne, all good things must come to an end. No. Died at City Hospital on Roosevelt Island in New York City on the 24th of May 1956 at the age of 78 years old. So did he see, he didn't see out his 300-year prison sentence? What a coward. That was collectively got okay. all of them. <laughs> but, yeah, he didn't sort of take one for the team there and do all 300, so... A little bit disappointing there. But, yeah, it's a pretty um, pretty insane life and he really packed a lot into into 78 years. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy. And he travelled all over and he did, uh, sounds like he did bad shit everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Definitely wasn't a uh, good person. But, you know, an interesting life and a tenuous link to World War One. Wasn't that tenuous. He was an active soldier in it, wasn't he? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, yeah. But, yeah, a baffling story. A lot happening there. Hard to sort of capture it all and, without... And how much do you reckon is true? Like it sounds like he just did a lot of bullshitting, a lot of aliases, all that sort of stuff. It's really hard to say, right? It is kind of hard to say. I mean, the bulk of what I've talked about today I think can be backed up by things. It's more like some of the smaller details of what he was doing at certain times, like maybe the bit with the gold could have been a bit bullshit or when he was a journalist in New York, maybe some of that was a bit um, embellished. When he was Kazusose. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. So, yeah, who knows? It is awesome to think that the, one of the greatest spies of the 20th century came up with the name Frederick Fredericks. <laughs> I know. There's hope for all of us. Wow, but also I Boris I spy. something. That was Boris. pretty good. Yeah. So he, and he got his man. He, he So even if... Like that's de- that definitely happened that that field marshal was yeah. was aboard that Kitchener. ship that went down. Yes. So, Kitchener, so yeah. and that so he, he that was in World War One, right? And then he also played the he, he made up an alias of an Australian World War One soldier and dined out on that. So he was yeah. like connected to World War One all over the shop, sort of. And World War Two, and yeah, obviously the Second Boer War, yeah. I looked that up. That was you were right. It was the the British were on the other side, which was pretty clear when Kitchener came. came yeah, yep. Yeah. So he really hated the British. And look, I kind of understand uh, why, because obviously your family were killed and everything, uh, everything you owned was destroyed. But um, yeah, an interesting way to deal with your grief. You know, that's not what you would do. But you um, get the Germans to uh, bomb. To blow up the ship that that guy was on, taking down seven hundred other people. You know what? It's it hard, to, hard say, to say, though, isn't it? It's hard to say what you position. would do in a moment. It's a hypothetical, um, so it is hard to say. Oh, I'd say not say. a great position that he was in. No, no, wouldn't want wouldn't want no. to be in that position. Yeah, but that um, that does bring us to the end of the um, of the report part of the show. That's got to be one of the wildest stories of one person's life that we've ever done. I reckon. Just so much, just so many different things. Like even it sort of gets to a point where you're like, okay, and and so this will be the end, and then it's like, nah, he was a spy in the Second World War as well. It's just baffling. So I felt like I kind of brushed over the last little part of his life a little bit there, but he just packed so much in. It was it was hard to sort of capture everything. So you know, better to have a little bit of everything, I would say. Yeah, I think this is just he seems like you know, sure, bad guy. In, in some ways, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but also just a real go-getter. Could not agree yes. more. I could not agree more. Yep. Absolutely. He was out there. He was getting things done, you know. Yeah. Whatever you think, 
of the Germans in the Second World War and how he was a spy for the Nazis. Yeah. You could argue. Whatever you think about the Nazis, <laughs> you know, put that aside for a sec. Put that to one side. This guy was a go-getter. <laughs> he had moxie. You've he got to moxie. give him that. Yeah. And and many different names. Mm. Frederick Frederick's obviously being the best one. That's yeah. the best, second best, Boris, whatever. He added there were a lot yep. of great names in this story and a lot of surnames yep. that I've never heard before, which I enjoy. Yeah, exactly. I think he made like most of too. them up. I oh, did, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> Jess did. Oh, so Jess made it's hard up. to know what of this story he made up, what of it's real, and what of it Jess made up. Yeah. Is this not a fictional podcast? Well, it's not meant to be. I think we normally oh, no. say it's a fact-based comedy podcast. Oh, I, we need to go back and delete all of my reports. Yeah, yeah. And then he found a unicorn. <laughs> all right. They always find a unicorn. Yeah, every, it's like, well, that's weird that Jess keeps finding these unicorn stories from history, but anyway. So I think, Jess, if that's the end of the report, that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show, the fact quote or question section. And I think it has a little jingle that goes something like this. Fact quote or question. Ding. Always remembers the ding. Now, the way to get involved in this is to go to dogoonpod.com or patreon.com slash dogoonpod and you can uh, support us on many different levels there. But the one to get involved uh, with if you want to get involved in the Fat Quota Question section is the Sydney Scheinberg Dykes Memorial Rest in Peace edition uh, level. Now, uh, once you do that, you get to give us a fact, a quote or a question and you also get to give yourself a title. There's heaps of other levels. Some of them uh, mean you can get multiple bonus episodes each month, the most recent of which we sort of alluded to during the episode where Dave found a book he wrote in 2000 or 2002. That's right, when I was just 12 years old, butter boy. Butter boy, and it was a, a Poirot-style murder mystery novel. And, um, yeah, he reads it or just... Dave and I take turns reading the chapters. It's a four-chapter book and it was it was a great fun time. A lot of the supporters who have already heard it have said it's, um, you know, one of their favourite bonus episodes we've done, which is cool. Anyhow, so you can get involved in all sorts of stuff on there. But for the fact, quote, or question section, uh, let's kick it off this week with the first one comes from, speaking of great names, Vincenzo Giovanni Bonadonna. Oh, uh, who's every beautiful. time. Vincenzo. It's just, that is like... Butter melting in my pasta filled ears. Yes. Uh, Does that make sense? Vinny's... You're going to get pasta out of there. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense to me, Dave. No explanation Thank you. required. Uh, Vinny's given himself the title of the gay hound and he's offered us a fact. And the fact is a not so fun fact about the Tuskegee. Oh no, this is a. Is this a. Oh no! This is something that we mispronounced. Oh, yeah. Some other people corrected us, and Tusk I'm like, oh. "Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee." A not so fun fact about the Tuskegee experiments. It's funny because people did correct me, and I'm like, "I really appreciate it," but it's possibly a word I'll never say again. And then I should have paid more attention. Not so fun fact about the Tuskegee experiments. What originally began as a six month study known as Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, turned into 40 years of what some might call an unethical approach to medical studies, including things such as uninformed consent and misleading information towards test subjects, not giving test subjects up-to-date treatments such as penicillin, and a wide variety of shady things. Luckily, settlements have been made and millions have been given to the families. Also a part of these settlements, the U.S. ensured to give lifetime medical benefits to surviving subjects and their families. At least there's a silver lining. Thank you guys always for the great content. Keep it up. Bloody hell, Vinny. That is, that's fucked. Would that count as a grim fact, Matt? That is a grim fact, yes. I think that is. We get one occasionally and that is, uh, I reckon that's definitely a grim fact. Thank you for sending that our way. And it Vinny. originally came out because it was a, a Lionel Richie album title. Tuskegee. Oh, that's right. And in a bonus episode you did about a music quiz. Yeah, that's right. I just I said we were playing for an album tonight uh, and I said it's, the, uh, it's Lionel Richie's and I think Matt asked which one and I just looked up the most recent one. And, uh, yeah, we mispronounced it 
Uh, we apologize. Uh, thank you, Vinny. The next fat quarter question comes from David Loring. Just given himself the title of, oh, geez, this is a long title. I don't read these, so I read them. <laughs> and sometimes it gets me in trouble. Here we go. Your dad, and he's disappointed that you've spent all day hungover in bed again because your mother worked really hard on your roast for lunch and your sister's at a very impressionable age and we know you're an adult and capable of making your own decisions but we want you to think about how that looks to the people around you a little more. But having said that, if you're feeling better now, we're about to play some Cluedo and you're more than welcome to join. What a title, David Loring. Uh, David, <laughs> David's Stream of offered consciousness, us, <laughs> David's offered us a fact and that is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is the one that opens with the very dramatic Da 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 dum notes. If you convert that into Morse code, dot 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 dash, it's the letter V, which is the Roman numeral for five. Also, the last fact I submitted was Morse code base two, and that's coincidental. I'm not secretly working for Big Morse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for clarifying, because I definitely would have thought Big Morse was on our case again. We were all pretty worried about I was. I went straight to Big Morse. Oh, here we go, yeah. Big Morse again. Uh, thank you very much, David Loring. That's a great fact, uh, assuming it's true. And the next <laughs> oh, one comes from Nathan, Nathan Damon, who's given himself the title of Officer in Charge of Rest and Relaxation. Nathan, an important Oh, job. mate, where have you been the last few months? Gosh. Uh, Nathan is also offered as a fact. That's three facts in a row this week. This one is the Venus flytrap is native to Hampstead or Hampstead in North Carolina. A uh, quick fact about North Carolina. They have blue <laughs> fire trucks. This is a stitch up for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nathan goes on to say, today you can find the plant throughout North Carolina and South Carolina. Unfortunate, unfortunately, the Venus flytrap is now an endangered plant due to the shrinking habitat and poachers. Huh. That's a fun fact. I never I really thought of the Venus flytrap. It, it feels like it's been invented by science, but, yeah, it just Nature did that. This, I mm. think that's so cool. And also free. I had it's one so as cool. a kid. Yeah, I thought it was, it was uh, I always felt bad when they got a fly. Because <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what a, yeah, it kills this planet. Like it actually eats things. And then it, I'm seeing this fly slowly die. I'm like, ah. Oh, so you started feeding it like batteries and Lego. Yeah, I was feeding it um, lentils. <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, this final one this week comes from Drew Forsberg and Drew has given himself the title American Liaison, Ministry for Ossification of Long Words. And, okay. <laughs> and Drew Forsberg <laughs> has a question to finish with this week and his question is, what's your favourite Coldplay song? Mine's a scientist. <laughs> 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 Good question. Jeez, I have to look up some of their songs. Oh. Uh, I reckon it's um, it's off that album. They had a. I remember. I told you that they played at a festival. I was at one time, and I was like feeling a bit too cool for them. And then, like mid set, uh, I was there with my sister, and she looked at me like, "I thought you didn't like them." And I'm hands up in the air, <laughs> 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 really feeling it. Yeah. Um, I think they're just one of those bands that is sort of like people shit on. They're just an easy band to shit on. But yeah, I really I like to, them. I I listened to their um, "Rush of Blood to the Head" album, which I think is what the scientist is off. I listen to that a lot at uni. I just listen to it overnight as I'm writing my last minute assignments. God put a smile on your face. That's a song. It's probably my favorite song of theirs. I reckon. I really like the song uh, "Violet Hill" off "Viva La Vida." The one where they had those uh, sort of French style uniforms. Yeah, yeah the, the sort of yeah, the marching beat kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I really liked uh, that whole album. I like Viva La Vida. Yeah, cool. I like Fix You, I think, a classic. Yeah, they are an easy band to shit on, but I do quite like them. Yeah, I like them. I've seen them live. It was like one of the, it was the best concert I've seen live. It was awesome. Wow. We've all seen Coldplay live, so there you go. I guess that's that's one of the things. About, I think they're just a, they're such a big band, and they're a little bit a little bit beige. I think is what gets people to hate on them. They're like yeah, they've got broad appeal, 
And uh, people hate it when cool people hate anybody creates appeal. something. Yeah, exactly. Popular, but yeah, I mean they reinvent themselves quite a bit, but it's always popular. So I don't really see. Yeah, you know, they're doing something right, aren't they? Yeah. But anyway, I, um, the question was really asked for that joke, which is very funny. People who don't get the reference: Shane Warne, Australian cricketer, the Sheik of Tweak, uh, the King of Spin. He had a talk <laughs> show for some reason, <laughs> which got cancelled pretty quickly. But on the first episode, he had. Uh, the singer from Coldplay, his name escapes me. Chris Martin. Chris Martin. And he asked Chris Martin, singer of Coldplay, the question, <laughs> what's your favourite Coldplay song? But before he could answer, he Shane Warne got <laughs> straight in. He said, what's your favourite Coldplay song? One's a scientist. Very funny clip. <laughs> and uh, Australian, Australian comedian or Australian New Zealand comedian Tony Martin clipped that out and he played it on the radio a lot and always <laughs> made me laugh. Um I'm sure I've shared this before somehow, but when I saw Coldplay play, uh, they brought out Shane Warne, who played harmonica yes. with them on one side. That's right. And the whole, because st- it was a stadium, and you could feel us all thinking, what the fuck is going on? Why are you here? <laughs> Why is Warne playing the harmonica? I mean, Very the funny. stadium went on board with it. No, you, you, like, especially the section I was in, people just looking at each other like, is that Shane Warne? <laughs> <laughs> like, out of all the guests they could bring out to, yeah. to join them. Very funny stuff. That's funny. I feel like I saw a clip, I might be getting this wrong, where Michael J. Fox came out and played with Coldplay but played one of the songs from Back to the Future. Am I making that up? It's probably, oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. I hope that's real. All right, well, that means it's time to thank a few of our other great Patreon supporters. These are the people who keep the show running and we appreciate them so much. Other awards, um, you know, apart from bonus episodes, you get uh, entry into the Facebook group for uh, supporters and uh, it's a nice little corner of the internet. And what are, what are some of the other things? You get to vote on the topics, like Jess's topic tonight was voted on by the listeners. Uh, when we do live shows or stream shows, you get uh, first, first access to tickets and often a discount. That's true. Yeah, that's right. And we've got – we should mention that, I guess. We've got uh, – Shows coming up at the Melbourne Comedy Festival. The first lot of tickets sold out really quickly and then the venue um, let us know we were allowed to uh, increase the capacity. So uh, there are still tickets available, I think maybe even for all shows at the moment. But they, they're they moving. Those units are moving. So if you are keen, oh, yeah. get involved. Um, there'll be a link in the show notes. I'm also doing a stand-up show called Nostalgia Was Better When I Was a Boy and it's on at... The Victoria Hotel in the Acacia Room, I think it's called. And, um, yeah, there should be a link to that in the show notes as well. Use the discount code Do Go On. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so <laughs> we normally thank a few of our other Patreon supporters here. Jess normally comes up with a little game that's based on the topic. What do you reckon, Bob? Yeah, it's a bit hard because I was doing the report today. I didn't have time Could to be think like about a, a game. Could be like a superhero nickname or another animal nickname. Yeah, I was thinking either an animal or... We just give them a, a fake spy name. Yeah, great. All right, love it. Well, if I may kick it all off, uh, I would love to thank from Spring Creek in Nevada in the United States, Logan Long. Oh, that already sounds like a fake name based on what I said before. It does. Alliteration. But your, your, your theory is that if you have any alliteration, that's, yeah. people, that's your mind going, oh, shit, 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 I'm David. Uh, yeah, I think Derek. so. So then Logan Long is already a spy name, so... Let's change that for him to a more inconspicuous spy name. So his name is now Logan Bundaberg. Oh, oh that's good. Very I good. I wouldn't. I wouldn't question Logan Bundaberg. <laughs> Me either. No, Jesse is sipping on a Bundaberg ginger beer right now. Yeah, I'm honestly <laughs> um, looking in around. In case the anyone room. at home, the next one. If anyone at home was the next going, one's going to be Nivea, geez, like my lip balm. Uh, Logan lamp. Logan iPhone. Uh, Lo- Logan plasterboard. <laughs> Logan Penn. I can play this game. Yeah, no, it's good. Logan Bundaberg. So we're just giving a surname, are we? I love it. All right, great. Logan Bundaberg. Codename LB. Uh, I'd also love to thank from State College in Pennsylvania, the United States, Gavin Cox. Gavin Cox. What about Gavin Thunderbird Cox? Yes. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That makes him stand out a little more, I'd say. Probably, but <laughs> but that's like his spy nickname. Right. Yeah, yeah. They call him the Thunderbird. Yeah, the after Thunderbird. his time, because he's because he walks kind of funny. 
<laughs> You're like a like marionette. He's, like he's a like he's a marionette. That's how he throws them off guard, and his enemies are like, "Oh, do you need a hand?" And then he goes, whoosh, kills him. I'm sorry, Sarah. You a marionette? Yeah, that's Bam. Good. Bam. That's great. Great work, Thunderbird Cox. Yeah. And finally, I'd love to thank from Brentwood in England, Will Hudson. Will. I mean, that that's a good inconspicuous name, isn't it? Will yeah, Hudson. Yeah, it is yeah. good. What about the Let's river? Make... Will the River Hudson. Oh, like that's it. good. That's good, yes. He's got he's got flow. <laughs> that's very good. And he's also got a Bruce Springsteen song and album, which is whenever he enters the room for, on the speaking circuit after his career's over, <laughs> the river plays and the crowd <laughs> goes wild. That's good. Closing song by River. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Live version from Barking Spiders Live 1983. Oh. Obviously. Is that the only version? Obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to thank a few Bopa? Yes. Um, I would love to thank from Longwood in Florida, only one name given here, which is mysterious in itself. I would love to thank Burroughs. Oh, Burroughs. That is what about mysterious. Codename Tarzan. Because oh, the creator, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I was thinking okay. the bunny, but, yeah, I like Burroughs even better. Yeah. Tarzan. Tarzan, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. That's very good. Um, Already mysterious though, Burroughs. This is perfect for that. I mean. Tarzan Burroughs. Yeah. We don't know who you are or what you did as long yeah. as you love us. And he calls his uh, rifle. What's one of the other characters from Tarzan? Does he have a pet or something? Cheetah. And his and his rifle's called Cheetah. Oh, that's so cool! It's like the Death really Cheetah cool. or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, secondly, I would love to thank from Dublin, in Ireland. I would love to thank uh, Cathal Grant. Cathal Grant. Oh, Grant. Uh, I'm going to call him the uh, Banana Boy. Banana Boy Grant. Yes, love that. Love that. There is a, There are some bananas in front of you. Perfect. BB. BB, Nailed it. Banana Boy. See, it's an obvious fake name, but uh, I guess I panicked. It works. And it does work. Banana Boy because he, he's got real high potassium, like almost inhuman levels of potassium. It's like dangerously high. Dangerously high. <laughs> well, normally people would die with that much potassium in their system. Not cathol. Not cathol. Not in this case. Um, and finally, for me, I would love to thank from St. Peter's in MO. Uh, uh, Montana, Is that Missouri? Missouri? I was going to say Missouri. You think it would be um, Montana? I would love to thank. Yeah, maybe not. It's Missouri. Sarah Sheel. Sarah, Sarah Sheel from Missouri. Sarah Sheel, the eel. Slippery <laughs> eel. Can't catch her. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, uh-huh. perfect. Slippery Sarah, the eel. They, think, they keep thinking they've got her and she. Just keeps getting away and no one knows how. Damn it, the eel's done it again. Damn you, eel. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah Sheel, the eel. I would like to now thank from Houston in Texas, Eli Fisher. Oh, the rocket. Oh, Eli, the rocket Fisher. I like that. Houston, we don't have a problem because... Eli is on the case. Oh, right. Yeah. There's no problems when Eli's, Eli's involved. I like it a lot. Yeah. Eli, the rocket fisher. I would also like to thank, going over to Great Britain, from Holmfirth and West Yorkshire, this is many beautiful names put together, Callum James Burgess Wiley. The terrier. Oh, oh yes. yeah, the Wiley terrier. Let's say <laughs> so send good. in the terrier. Yeah. Callum James Burgess Wiley. Terrier. The Terrier. This is a job for the Terrier. <laughs> and then Callum arrives and he's only five foot tall and everyone's like, oh, what's the problem? And then, you know, five minutes later, there's 36 foot four guys knocked out, him, last man standing. Yeah. Yep. Very yappy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but gets the job done. Yeah. Am I going to get paid for this or what? <laughs> All right, Callum. <laughs> oh, I'd love to Callum, thank. kill him. <laughs> Callum, kill him. <laughs> I'd like to thank finally from South Australia in Mawson Lakes. I'd like to thank Amanda Mullins. Amanda M- Mullins, the thinker. 
Oh, oh I love it. Think, uh, She's yeah. mulling it over. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> no, I see yeah. what you've done there. Amanda, Thank you. the thinker. Send in the thinker. Is that, yeah. is that a pun? No. Oh. Or maybe. I don't oh, know anymore. Yeah, I don't know. Well, and feels then, like it could be. I wouldn't be surprised one way or the other, to be honest. Mm, These Amanda days. goes in. He's wondering, am I going to get paid for this or what? So um, <laughs> they've all been hired by a very crooked person who has not paid anyone. I'm sorry to everyone on the list today, but none of you have been paid yet. Uh, we will speak to our accountant. Regrettably. But thank we'll you, to our accountant. one and all. Uh, like I say, uh, without these people, this show doesn't exist. So thank you one more time to Amanda, Callum, Eli, Sarah, Cathal, Burroughs, Will, Gavin and Logan. Uh, the other thing we like to do just to finish you up legends. the show is welcome in a few people into the Triptych Club. Uh, the way that you can get involved here is being on the shout-out level or above for three straight years and then you get welcomed into the Triptych Club and inside the club. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's basically your happy place and our happy place. It's everyone's happy place. It's a big old club. Uh, I'm standing at the door with the velvet rope and the door list. Dave uh, is inside. He's booked the band, but he also hypes you up as you come in. So if you are, for instance, feeling a little down, even though you're on your way into this exclusive club, Dave will pick you back up. And then Jess, uh, who's also looked after the hors d'oeuvres and the cocktails, she also then hypes up Dave. So, uh, Jess, firstly, what, what have we got on the menu tonight? This week we have Aperol Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> is that a pun? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, and German sausages. Ah, Fritz and Fritz. Little boys. Something. They don't go that well together, but <laughs> it also just kind of works somehow, you know. But that's what you got. So good. And Dave, who have you booked for the band? Uh, we have booked tonight, uh, hitting centre stage. We've got uh, No Doubt. Oh. <laughs> When's Defining and the Boys are back together? Having just spoken at length about Coldplay, why would I have thought you would have gone <laughs> down that direction? <laughs> yeah, I thought he would too, but he loves to zig when we think he's going to zag. That's right. Uh, I will tell you that Shane Warne will be accompanying them on harmonica as uh, requested. <laughs> He knows, he knows all the songs. Don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So there's only a couple of inductees this week, uh, Dave. Thank God. So uh, the first one uh, got in contact with me because I'd let her slip through the gap. She's actually should have been inducted uh, about two months ago. So sorry to you, but uh, give her a very warm welcome. Hopefully Dave uh, makes it up to you with a beautiful pump up here oh, from God. McKinney in Texas, the United States. It's Elizabeth Lefebvre. Oh, Lefebvre. Well, let me just say get McKinney and that's what I mean, any in the club. Just get in the club because we've missed you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jess, hype me up. Hype me up. Come on. I didn't even need to, Dave. You'd already nailed it, but woo. Thank you so much. Oh, I did not believe that from Jess. Um, uh, Liz, uh, great to have you in all honesty. Um, I'm just glad you could... See Shane Warne live in the club. Uh, Liz also got a mention at the start of this week's uh, or last week's Josh Earl podcast because um, she came across another Josh Earl and uh, so that was pretty fun. Wild episode of – have you heard that one yet, Dave? With No, who was on that one? Greg Lass and Peter Hellier, your boss. <laughs> very good. Was it uh, a very, you know, some wild stories being told? Yes, it was very. It was in front of a live audience. Very funny stuff. Um, all right, and and you know made all the sweeter with the Liz reference right up the top. Uh, but the other inductee this week comes from Baduri in Queensland. It's Patrick Tully. <laughs> nothing is gonna. Nothing is gonna Tully this night because you are here. Yeah, Tully rhymes with Sully, and Sully, Sully isn't a good yes. thing. That's a type of pun. That's a bit of a pun. Thank you. Patrick, You've honestly, anything happens in this club, that means that I can shake your hand like we used to in the old days. I can even give you a hug and say, come on down. I love it, Dave. That's why they call him the pun master. Because he you. comes up with such, if that is a pun, and I'm not 100% sure that it was, but uh, 
Uh, great work. So thank you so much to Liz and Patrick for your three plus years of support. It means so much, you goddamn legends. Appreciate that a lot. I really do. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Well, we've had some laughs, we've had some times, and yet, sadly, we have to go for another week. But you can get in contact with us at any time by hitting up dogoonpod.com and following links to our merchandise, our Patreon, where you can suggest a topic. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at dogoonpod. And we have an email. It's dogoonpod at gmail.com. But until next week, I'll say thank you so much for listening. And until then, goodbye. Laters. Bye. This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. I mean, if you want. It's up to you.